इसमें देखिएगा ना हाई एवरी वन वेलकम टू आवर टूडेज इंटीग्रेटेड सेशन ऑफ ऑफथर्मोलॉजी एंड फार्माकोलॉजी एंड विथ मी वी हैव नन अदर दैन द डॉन ऑफ ऑफथर्मोलॉजी दैट इज डॉक्टर शाश्वत रे सर सर हाउ डू वी थिंक दैट दिस सेशन इज गोइंग टू हेल्प द स्टूडेंट इन आवर टूडेज सेशन आई गुड इवनिंग वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू यू फ्रॉम एलन स्टूडियोज न्यू डेली वी आर डूइंग दिस टेलीकास्ट फ्रॉम एंड वी हैव द प्लेजर ऑफ वेलकम टू मी एंड डॉक्टर सराज for integrated session i hope you in, interact with us you enjoy the session and because you see <coughs> ophthalmology is a very important topic and pharmacology which people find it difficult to understand we're going to discuss how we tackle the questions first we read the question we tackle the question according to the question asked okay? we have to discuss it why this is the option why that is not the option okay? so we'll do that one by one All right. So, uh, saying that, let's get started with uh, some of the important question. And what we can assure you from this session that by the end of this session, you will be end up revising some of the very very high yield topic of pharmacology and of thermology. And we are expecting at least two to three marks from this session of today in any of the examination, be it I N I C T or F M G that you are planning. So, I'll be starting with the very very uh, first uh, question. uh that is going to be uh, about a 45 year old patient who is presenting with the shown scenario as has been given here which of the following is true about its causal agent and preferred drug sir over to you what do you think is the diagnosis and how do you think that the stu- uh, I mean student will be come coming up with the diagnosis here oh yes means the question is a 45 year old patient presents with the shown clinical presentation what is the presentation you see here this typical dendritic lesion okay so dendritic lesion remember that we have only one cause and that's caused two dendrites and how do i know it's a two dendrite two dendrite because of the branching linear lesion like the branches of a tree okay this particular pattern remember we have called two dendrites is only seen in herpes simplex virus so that is why the answer is hsv however there remember there are conditions which look like that we call them as dendritic pseudo dendrites okay this is two dendrite and then we call pseudo dendrites The two dendrites can you remember is found only in herpes simplex virus. And how do I know it's a two dendrite? Because first the shape, like the tree branches of a tree. Why? Because it follows the corneal nerves. The virus attacks the nerves. Okay, it's a neurotrophic virus, and that's the pattern of the corneal nerves. So it takes this pattern. Remember, there's something called a pseudo dendrites, which we'll discuss in the next question, which can be seen in other conditions like like a canthamoeba, like contact lens wearers, like drug induced. Uh, SPKs, you know things like that. So, but however, two dendrites is only in this case, and that is why this is herpes simplex. So the answer here here going to be is B herpes simplex, and the drug is acyclovir. Uh, over to you, Doctor Siraj. Uh, yes, uh, herpes simplex. We have already seen how to diagnose. Uh, that was very beautifully explained. And acyclovir, as we all know, that uh, the drug of choice for any of the herpes simplex virus infection. Will be none other than your acyclovir. We have some other drugs as well, but again, acyclovir is the drug of choice for this scenario. Two important question that is very frequently asked uh, from acyclovir: What is the mechanism of action? So do remember, guys, acyclovir. It's one of the guanosine analog. Question number one that has been asked in the past. Apart from that, remember it is uh, one of the HSV, herpes simplex virus, uh, DNA polymerase inhibitor. DNA polymerase inhibitor. Now, whenever we give the acyclovir as a drug, it is not directly going to inhibit the herpes DNA polymerase. This acyclovir or let's say pencyclovir, they will be converted to its active moiety or active form. That will be acyclovir or pencyclovir monophosphate followed by diphosphate. This diphosphate will be further converted to triphosphate. Do remember a very very important point. Whatever triphosphate that is formed here, it will be incorporated in the viral DNA in the viral genome, and that will be inhibiting the enzyme. DNA polymerase. Once they inhibit it again, the viral replication will stop. That is how they are uh, going to uh, work in this scenario. To another question that has been asked, how they are developing the resistance? I think it has been given already in the screen. If there is some alteration in the target enzyme, or if there is alteration in the enzyme that is activating, so what is the name of the enzyme that is activating? Most common enzyme will be your. herpes simplex virus that is tyrosine kinase and other one will be your dna polymerase if there is any alteration in the dna polymerase 
right alteration in this one then that will be causing a resistance from the acyclovir so this will be our first question and we have also covered some of the important areas from here sir i think in one of the recent examination recently they asked something about the dye or the filter that is used oh, yes. would you like to talk something about that oh yes that is absolutely right in the neat <coughs> pg exam conducted about a month back only the mm -hmm. question same question was given mm -hmm. and the same the first the, but the question was asked differently they give you a similar kind of a picture mm -hmm. and they did not ask the diagnosis they asked what is the filter in which you see, as you can see the picture, if you go back to the picture, you see it's a blue colored filter and they asked <coughs> the dye that we used to stay in the green dye. So that's an interesting question. It's a takeoff on the normal diagnostic and management question that we will ask. Please remember that the dye is fluorescein dye. Okay? Fluorescein dye is very important for corneal problems and fluorescein stains this very brightly as you can see. And the bluish light that you see is a cobalt blue filter. You know? With a normal light of the state lamp, you cannot see these very well. The blue light that you see is of cobalt blue filter and the stain is fluorescein stain. Please remember this, these are important points. And remember this is herpes simplex, you know, in any condition of eye, in all corneal clinics around the world, we have this one important point. That if you have a unilateral keratitis and there are no predisposing causes, you know, like there's no contact lens wear, there's no trauma, there's no drug induced thing and the patient just comes to you with unilateral one eye and the picture is somewhat like this which is not very clear cut dendrites then you have to assume it is herpes simplex virus in the absence of contact lens wear in the absence of uh, any trauma in the absence of any predisposing cause like uh, refractive surgery if the patient comes to his corneal ulcer with irritation and watering you have to assume it is herpes simplex virus. Okay, this is very important because HSV keratitis is one of the rare uh, manifestation of herpes simplex where it's actually due to a live virus. And because it is because the live virus is jumping, bouncing from cell to cell, so that is what the reason for typical dendritic lesion is. Right. So dendritic lesion is a term that has been used a couple of times and we have seen in FMG and also in the neat PG examination. Something related to this, there was also a name geographical ulcer. Sir, what is that? See, geographic uh, dendritic ulcer, when it becomes expanded, you expanded. Know, when it becomes larger, then we call it geographic ulcer. It's called geographic because it looks like the map of some country on an atlas of geography, you know. So, you will have Africa, you will have US, you will have Texas, you know, things like that. And geographic ulcer usually means two things. One, that the patient has been treated with topical steroids, which should not have been done because I told you it's a live virus. We cannot use topical steroids. Or, second, the patient is immunocompromised. So whenever you see a geographical ulcer, please remember that either topical steroids have been used or it's immunocompromised patients like diabetes, like HIV. So that would lead to the bigger kind of an ulcer which is called geographic ulcer. And so this is an absolute fact that you cannot treat, cannot treat steroids to a, a fluorescein a positive dendritic ulcer. Please remember that's a very unique thing because of the entire manifestation of herpes simplex right, keratitis. Right. This is the only place where you mm -hmm. cannot use a steroid. Others you can mostly in herpetic we can use a combination of you know antiviral and right. a steroid. Right. This is the only one because we have a live virus here. In any of the ulcer we should avoid. Yes. I think steroid is something that is very dangerous. All right. So I think with uh, uh, this kind of explanation that we have discussed, uh, you know, um, we can go ahead with the second question here. And this is one table here that is uh, summarizing all the antiviral agent that is utilized for ophthalmic use. So you guys can take a screenshot or uh, uh, you know you can keep this in your phone uh, to, for revising that what are the other agents that you can use. As I was mentioning to all of you guys that acyclovir definitely can be used. The other agents, let me just add on a couple of more information then we can proceed. Other agent that we can use will also be your, uh, your uh, trifluoridine. and idoxuridine. These are the other two agents, idoxuridine. Right, these are actually thymidine analog. This thymidine analog, they also get incorporated in the viral DNA and they also act by inhibiting the DNA polymerase that we have, right. And in addition to this, uh, we can go ahead with the next question that we have. You guys can take screenshot of this one. And the second question that we have, I think something like this we have already spoken. Sir, over to you. Yes. So the next question is uh, similar but not the same. Mm -hmm. It says a 35-year-old female patient, a soft contact lens wearer, 
presents with a corneal ulcer of the right eye. Mm -hmm. She has severe pain and a pseudodendrites on the cornea and is not responding to acyclovir, a suspected herpes simplex virus keratitis. What should be the next drug in this case? So first, to answer this question, we'll have to first diagnose it. Diagnose and only case. then we can mm -hmm. diagnose it. So, right, as we said, you know, look at this. This is what it is, this similar patient, but you see, has there are a couple of points here which are ruling against a uh, true dendritic, which is herpes. What is that? The first of all is that it is pseudodendrite. Remember, the pseudodendrite is not a real dendrite. Okay, it looks like that. Okay, but it is not true. How do we mechanize? First, it does not stain brightly with the fluorescein stain, like that green stain <coughs> we saw. It doesn't do that. Okay, that is one. Second is that it has no terminal end bulb. So you will see this typical, you know, ter terminal end bulb which you see in herpes, which is not present in a pseudodendrite. Third, these are more peripheral. Dendrites are always usually central, they are more peripheral, pseudodendrites will be more peripheral. And fourth is that they look like painted on appearance, you know, it's as if you have pitched it on. It's not an uh, excavation, it's not an ulcer which is uh, excavated into the <coughs> corneal epithelium, it looks like painted on. Okay? So these are called pseudodendrites and they can have multiple causes. One of them could be contact lens, where people who wear contact lenses, you know, they often develop these. Second could be acanthema keratitis. Okay? Third could be certain drugs which are causing SPKs. So, fourth could be pseudo uh, herpes zoster. So, these are the multiple causes of the uh, pseudodendrites, herpes zoster, acanthamoeba, contact lens wear. You know? So, these are the multiple causes that we have there. So, this is pseudodendrites. So, that is one. Second, again, remember, this has a contact lens, also history of contact lens ulcer. So, that is the second clue. The third clue is that severe pain. So, these all these three things combine to tell us that it is not really HSV. It is actually the most common mimic, which mimics herpes simplex, is acanthumba keratitis. Please remember this important point that whenever you have a non-healing ulcer to herpes simplex, anti-herpetic treatment, you have to think of acanthumba. It no. mimics it very importantly because of the pseudendrites and because you have contact lens ulcer. Remember, contact lens, the second commonest is acanthumba. And the severe pain, the, it's well known for its pain. The pain keeps the patient awake at night, neither does he himself sleep, nor let us sleep, you know, constantly ring up on the phone. So, this is actually, it is not really, it is not really dendritic, it is pseudodendrite and the answer is acanthamoeba. Acanthamoeba keratitis. So, Dr. <coughs> Suraj will tell us what is the treatment for acanthamoeba. Uh, I think, sir, acanthamoeba keratitis, ke liye we don't have much drug, but there is one compound that we use as a drug of choice. We call it as a PHMB. PHMB. Sir, is it commercially available? Do you practice? I mean, no. Do, do you the, prescribe the this? The problem is this. The PHMB, which stands yes. for polyhexamethylene biguanide, mm. is uh, cannot be formulated. You know, it is not present as a pharmacological drug. You cannot buy it off the counter. So, you have to make it fresh. That is one problem. Okay. And remember that the treatment for acanthema takes at least six months. You know, when you start, you start treating it, you have to ensure that the patient, you have to tell him that, look, it will take months for this treatment. So, be prepared for a lengthy, lengthy treatment. Longer duration of therapy, that is one of the very, very important cause. And one more question that was coming, uh, I think a couple of students always used to message that uh, in a contact lens wearer, do you think that uh, other organisms like bacteria can also cause oh, some yes, problem? Absolutely, Dr. Yes. So, as you see, the, whenever we have contact lens, remember the most common organism, as all of you know by now, mm -hmm. is Pseudomonas. Number right. one is Pseudomonas, always. Okay? Right. So, whenever, you see, the problem is that contact lens wearers, any Pseudomonas can attack any time. But for acanthamoeba, you need one more thing. So, acanthamoeba is number two, as I said, <coughs> second most common. And this is when you wash your lenses with water, okay? And with water, lens, contact lens should not be contacted with any kind of water. Tap water, normal water, boiled water, saline water, any water should not touch your lenses, okay? So, when you wash your lenses with water, then we get acanthamoeba. So, whenever we get to see the history of washing of length in tap water, Right? Uh, am I correct, sir? I think yes. this was the exact question that was asked. Exactly. In uh, tap water, this question is always and always associated with none other than our acanthamoeba. So, students should take care of this one and uh, the treatment will be again your PHMB, polyhexamethylene biguanide. PHMB. And uh, two important questions that I can discuss uh, for all of you guys that this will be given topically that is in the form of eye drop. It is freshly prepared by some certified uh, pharmacist. You know, it's not available commercially as sir was mentioning to all of you guys. And second thing is that how is it going to work? What's the mechanism of action of this one? Right. So they are mainly a cell membrane inhibitor. 
right a cell membrane inhibitor and because of this one again they will be producing cytal effect they will be causing leakage of the intracellular content from inside to outside and again they will be producing cytal effect now there are some studies that are also saying that we can also use topical chlorhexidine in this scenario in addition to that some oral drugs like a drug for kala azar that we have been using since ages miltefosine it has also been uh, recommended as a oral drug and some of the important imidazole derivatives like drugs like your itraconazole itraconazole drugs like your fluconazole these are the oral drugs that can also be utilized but in addition to that if the examiner is ever going to ask what is the most preferred drug best drug drug of choice none other than your PHMB. I think uh, we are quite clear here, sir, yes, with this question like definitely. this. That whenever you get to see a history of any contact lens wearer and washing their lens in any water, running water, tap water, it will always and always be acanthoma keratitis, pain out of proportion, severe pain, and uh, the important diagnostic features, sir, has already mentioned. So I think we can take the uh, next question, sir. I would like to summarize this by saying yes. that you know whenever you have acanthoma, mm -hmm. so what we're looking for are three things. Mm -hmm. One is first the pseudo the pseudodendrites. Pseudo so you have these SPK kind of things, pseudodendrites, mm -hmm. which will be telling you. Second, the pain is out of proportion. Yes. And it, it doesn't look very inflamed, but it looks very, very painful. Mm -hmm. And this is because of a property called radial keratoneuritis. Mm -hmm. Radial keratoneuritis is it affects the corneal nerves. That's why it's so painful. Right. And the third thing about acanthema is the classic ring-shaped appearance. It's a typical ring-shaped ulcer. Mm -hmm. So if you leave these three points, you know, first the pseudodendrites. Second, radial keratoneuritis, and third is the ring-shaped ulcer. This would help you diagnose acanthamoeba. And as I said, acanthamoeba is a very difficult diagnosis, and it is a very much more difficult treatment for the poor patient who has yeah. to undergo treatment for six months, and it may result in corneal scarring, and it may resolve, but we may not be able to see anything because it results in corneal scarring. Yeah. Right, sir. So this is the summary of this particular question. I would like to ask you, Dr. Shiraz, yes, many sir. of my students ask me, and I'm mm -hmm. sure you have the peers, why is it so difficult to study pharmacology? And how do I have any tips to memorize pharmacology? So many drugs, so many mechanisms of action, so many other things that you have. Uh, actually, sir, that was a very good question that you asked. So most of the time, we get to hear uh, the reason why uh, this thing is running in the market or among the students is that they think pharma is difficult. They have already made, uh, you know, perception in their brain that pharma is difficult. So what happens when something is difficult? Our brain is very smart. It always try to escape away from the difficulties and uh, you know, as the end result we end up trying you know we end up scrolling our reels we end up looking at our phone or we try to read our favorite subject like uh, gynecology or <laughs> whatever subject that they feel is their favorite subject yeah. so when you are already weak in that and you think it's difficult and you don't read when you don't read you don't know you don't know you become more weak Correct. and this becomes a vicious, vicious cycle. cycle absolutely so to uh, uh, summarize that i would only say that if you think that pharma is uh, not strong or if you think the pharma is weak i would be recommending all my students that start from uh, the like very uh, small areas you know start from let's say uh, one to two pages or of your notes on the daily basis believe me as the time proce you know, proceeds you will end up having good marks from pharmacology and uh, to uh, answer your second question how do we make it uh, uh, you know uh, interesting see in our classes we don't just ke keep on uh, discussing the drugs and tell you the mechanism of action and no we don't go like that we make sure that we give some important stories behind each of the drugs if you have attended the classes you know and those stories are actually linked to the drugs or some important mnemonics that are actually linked and you know? so some live mnemonics live stories live you know, discussion about some patient we utilize those stories mainly uh, to describe those drugs so that is one way uh, that i use actually uh, to you know, uh, simplify the subject sir wonderful sir, because i remember even in my you know po uh, postgraduate days the sir. difficulty we had with drugs Totally the magazine, one can remember the drug and you use so many mnemonics also right. to treat it. Yeah, but sometimes it's difficult to memorize the mnemonic also. <laughs> so, so pharma the is not easy. Yes. That is there. But you have to have it. You Most of the time the student tend to remember the mnemonic but they forget exactly. what is that mnemonic exactly. for. Exactly. And so for that only we make mnemonic which is uh, like let's say if you are going to read the mnemonic you should know about that what is this mnemonic for. Exactly. So mnemonic or kis ke liye hai this is all summarized in that story or the mnemonic. Correct. Sir. So, I think we can take the next question, sir. Yes, please, please. We'll go yes. to the next question. Uh, sir, over to you. The next question, ladies and gentlemen, is this one. In a 40-year-old patient with a history of HIV, the following finding <coughs> is recorded. Which of the following is most preferred oral drug for this condition? So, first, ladies and gentlemen, we have to look at the picture, very yes. dramatic picture. This red and white that you see is the famous 
thing called as tomato ketchup is not it's called scrambled eggs and tomato ketchup appearance also called as pizza pie appearance okay now ophthalmology is full of beautiful terms mm. for terrible things you know <laughs> i think there's no other subject on earth with such beautiful descriptions for such terrible conditions imagine calling this as scrambled eggs and tomato ketchup pie appearance but we all heard about this this is a very dramatic picture and the his the clue has already given is hiv so this is going to be cmv retinitis cytomegalovirus retinitis is the most common cause of the most common ocular finding in hiv is not so this is the most common ocular infection you no know? actually finding would not be correct most common ocular infection in hiv remember cmv retinitis is seen in very severe cases of hiv where the, already the cd4 count has dropped below 50 below 50 the normal cd4 count is almost 500 <coughs> but this is dropped below 50 no per microliter and so this is one infection which comes there so this is first we have diagnosed this cmv retinitis and patient typically presents with you know they comes with loss of vision come with floaters with scotomata you know and so please remember cmv retinitis is a very dangerous condition and when we treat it we do not get that vision back you know because that loss of vision retina is gone we can only save whatever is left behind so cmv retinitis is remember is a very very dangerous infection that we have in hiv So can we say the damage is irreversible here? Yes, please. We can definitely say that damage is irreversible. So what you actually do is to save further vision, what is left. You know, you cannot get that vision back. Right. And these, unfortunately, even if you treat them, they can be recurrent. They can be recurrent, and they can land up with retinal detachments also. Right, uh, sir. I was reading somewhere that in a HIV patient, what is the most common cause of vision loss? The commonest cause of visual loss in CMV retinitis is this only. Is in CMV HIV patient, yes. is CMV retinitis. CMV retinitis. So yes. we can say that there is one more question that CMV retinitis it happens to be the most common cause of vision loss in HIV patient. Exactly. Right. Most common cause of vision loss in HIV patients. So that can be another important Absolutely. question yes. for all of you guys. Okay. So uh, for this scenario. uh can we see what would be the possible answer by doctor uh, that we have dr nakshanal gai and dr dogot or any other student who would like to give that which of the following is the preferred agent for this scenario see most of the time we read the cmv retinitis the drug of choice is going to be gancyclovir but look at the question very very carefully the question is asking about which of the following is the oral drug that is preferred oral drug and if you have to choose sir in your opd what do you choose usually iv or oral if you have sir, to give without to any doubt oral drug so oral drugs. iv is obviously painful to the patient right and these are only immunocompromised you always right. care about catheter <laughs> sepsis mm -hmm. know, that when we remember we have to do daily almost mm -hmm. so the drug of choice even if it was not mentioned as oral suppose mm -hmm. you had a choice between you know this and this a drug of choice remember in practical scenario we always prefer oral drug right okay because right. iv drugs are painful right. and the infections are many right right so i think well gancyclovir it is nothing but the oral pro drug of gancyclovir exactly sir. right so correct. the correct answer that will be going ahead with be gan you know well gancyclovir which happens to be the oral pro drug only it's the oral pro drug of gancyclovir which happens to be the drug of choice in a patient with a cmv right now can we also use foscarnet in this scenario the answer to this question is yes usually always and always remember uh, two important thing that we usually discuss one is uh, what is the drug of choice in a patient with the herpes simplex virus that we have discussed i guess yes herpes simplex virus we have told you that it is going to be acyclovir then second thing is that if the examiner is going to ask you what is the drug of choice for cmv so we are going to use the pro drug because the better pharmacokinetic property or orally available well gancyclovir or injectable me if it is going to ask we will be choosing gancyclovir correct right in any of the scenario if there will be resistance from this if there is going to be any resistance for this r for resistance here then in that case scenario we are going to choose the agent that is your foscarnet so foscarnet can i say it's the drug of choice for resistant cases of cmv retinitis it's the drug of choice for resistant cases of or i would say resistant cmv retinitis if the examiner is going to frame something like this because i have seen in a 2020 aims examination they asked the question about foscarnet that whether it is given uh, in sensitive patient or resistant patient those who are in case of cmv or in patient with the hsv and how is it going to work foscarnet if uh, we just quickly just take it 
you know it is having multiple mechanism of action one of which will be your reverse transcriptase inhibitor it is also one of the dna polymerase inhibitor right and one more thing that we know that they themselves are active they do not require phosphorylation that is very very important thing in the previous question sir i was discussing that any acyclovir when we are give going to give it will be converted to monophosphate diphosphate triphosphate which will be incorporated in the dna and then they are going to inhibit dna polymerase in contrary uh, in contrary to that phoscarnate it itself is a active moiety and they will directly inhibit they do not require their phosphorylation so that is one advantage with the phoscarnate that we can utilize and there was one image that i have shown you previously as well that for the cytomegalovirus cmv retinitis these are the four drugs that i was mentioning to all of you guys one of which will be phoscarnet iv your sidofovir also iv next that i was telling you will be your none other than valgancyclovir this is the only oral agent we have gancyclovir as well which is given by topical or iv sir what do you, what do you say about topical in cmv retinitis how effective is it going to be it is not going to help at all mm. dr raj you see because this is cmv retinitis topical right. drugs do not have enough penetration right. to go beyond the aqueous humor so right. topical gancyclovir is out of the question it doesn't okay. help at all we have to give either iv or oral either system. iv or the oral right so i think uh, it's pretty clear that we are having four drug for cmv Uh, retinitis that has been mentioned already on the screen very very important table we can take the next question i guess sir yes please sir the next question is again on a kind of an ulcer as i can see on the mm -hmm. picture is a right. 55 old farmer mm -hmm. was brought to the opd with the shown condition right there is a history of injury to the right eye a few days ago while mm -hmm. he was working in his field mm -hmm. which one of the following agents is contraindicated in management so now when you read this question let's see what are the clues that given to us is a farmer and the injury of injury to the eye while is working in his field Sweet. okay so we have this history of a vegetable organic matter patient working in his field very common scenario actually particularly mm -hmm. in our country where there's a lot of agriculture so particularly in the south there's a lot of agriculture mm -hmm. and a quick look at the ulcer it shows us the mm -hmm. typical finger like projections you can see the finger like projections in the surrounding stroma with a fluffy feathery margin is a fluffy feathery margin here and this is none else there are old friend a fungal keratitis the classic satellite lesions are not visible here but then you don't get satellite lesions in every case of fungal ulcer that would be a textbook picture however uh, this is not textbook but the reasonable textbook let me tell you the finger like projections which surround with fluffy feathery margins mm -hmm. the raised uh, looking dry appearance the absence of congestion remember that these are fungal ulcers these are absolutely fungal ulcers the diagnosis right. here is fungal keratitis and even if you look at the conjunctiva it's not very much inflamed no that is what the fungal keratitis is well known for it has no not much symptoms the patient has no pain not much redness no watering is very comfortable okay but he doesn't have symptoms when he comes to us that's why he comes to us late and when you see this then we tell him it's fungal keratitis by the typical appearance okay so the appearance enough but always remember it's not always classic textbook like this so we have diagnosed fungal keratitis and the question is which is contraindicated so before we contraindicate first doctor shall i'll ask you to first tell us the drug of choice here then we'll talk about contraindicate uh, actually sir the drug of choice in this scenario it is always going to be natamycin why so because this is the only agent that is available topically right and uh, the question is actually asking about contraindication okay. which is contraindicated now most of the time this was the one question sir this was exact question that that was asked not with the image but in 2016 17 fmg and most of the student they immediately just they read that signs are more compared to symptom i think we yeah. used to call that where signs yeah, are more than signs signs are more than symptom mm. and they immediately marked natamycin and saying sir there was the question of fungal keratitis and i have marked natamycin but, but the it actually is asked what is contraindicated yes right so you have to be very very careful that contraindicated drug sir that will be here the contraindicated drug here ladies and gentlemen is going to be b and that is dexamethasone steroids right. you know right. steroids right. are contraindicated <coughs> in most ulcers but putting steroid in a fungal ulcer Right. is like putting right. you know by dr shaw and on to you can already you know it is like putting ghee on fire okay yes ek like a this is this is it will spread like mad okay mm. spread like mad please remember we do use steroids sometimes in fungal uh, in not bigger part not fungal also in <coughs> ulcers and why so because we try to prevent the scarring so right. if you put steroids we do put it sometimes but remember mm. the three drugs the mm. three also we never put steroid mm. one is fungal absolutely contraindicated second is acanthamoeba Okay, and third is nocardia. These are three 
organic ulcers. First is fungus, second is acanthamoeba, and third is nocardia, where we will not like to put steroids. In fact, even bacterial ulcers, we will only start steroids once we after two things. First, we have diagnosed the what kind of bacterial ulcers. Is it pseudomonas? Is it staphylococcus? First, we have identify the causative agent and second when we see that the drug is producing the healing effect once we see the healing started then we can judicially start steroids to avoid the post conal scarring that happens okay right. but never in fungal and with great caution acanthema and nocardia right so i think i immediately made a mnemonic as well fan that is fungal ulcer, acanthamoeba and nocardia. Absolutely. These are the three important area where steroids should usually be contraindicated. Now, uh, in addition to this, sir, how common is this condition in your clinical practice? This is actually uh, fairly common. Fungal mm -hmm. conus, as I said, is very common in India because, you know, these are organic matter injuries. Mm -hmm. And the most common scenario is usually these are farmers. They're working in their fields, you know, in right, but in Delhi NCR, we have farming in, you know, communities in half, Punjab, in Haryana, in Rajasthan and all. And even though Delhi per, per se is not, you know, agriculture, community and South India particularly mm. where as I said there is warm climate, lot of rainfall, it encourages the growth of the fungus. So this is very very common. Okay. You have a lot of love for South India sir, I believe. I, I have a lot of love for India actually, right. you know, in all India. Okay. South India because I have done my fellowship there, so oh, I do have nice. no, <coughs> uh, love for that. But that include, that doesn't mean that I don't <laughs> love the rest of them. <laughs> But the other drugs that you see here, yeah, yeah. is absolutely indicated because remember yes. these are uh, cyclopegics. Yes. So they will have to immediately reduce the pain. Cyclopegics we like to ask. Methyl cellulose. Methyl cellulose is a lubricant. We like to lubricate the eyes mm. also because you are mm. using so many drugs, mm. you know, so they become dry usually. You see, for antifungals, the problem is first, there are not too many antifungals available. You're right. Second, the penetration is very poor. Mm. These most of the drugs are very poorly penetrating. And when we get an ulcer which is already penetrated deep, then it becomes very difficult to treat these ulcers. Sir, usually when you use the term that the signs are more than the symptom, there are no active symptoms in the patient, Correct. then why will the patient come to us? I mean, that what is the reason. The you see why they don't come to us, you know, yes. usually they come to us after 10-15 days. Okay. And okay. by that time it's already, you know, there are hardly any pain, there's no right. pain, there's no redness, no redness you know, right. there's no watering also. So, and these are mostly, as I said, these are farmers. So, they, uh, the, uh, the, the pressure to earn a livelihood mm -hmm. is too much. You know, the pressure mm -hmm. to grow crops, feed right. the family, you know, mm -hmm. keep the home fires burning, mm -hmm. you know, is too much for them to, you know, worry about small matters in the eye. <laughs> and there's no pain. So, there's no redness. You know, so, they often come very late right. to us. Right. That is the problem. Yeah. With respect to pharma, I just remember, I have seen a lot of question whenever it is asked farmer in pharmacology. Pharma in pharma, it is always going to be organophosphate carbamate, mm. and in uh, of uh, sorry in pharma mm. organophosphate carbamate in ophthalmology, it is mostly going to be Correct. this fungal keratitis. Absolutely. This is one very thing good. that I have seen the very repeatedly asked topic and question. Okay, so uh, I think uh, we can discuss about natamycin, and if I ask you what is the drug of choice, you can say okay, sir, the drug of choice it is going to be natamycin, which is one of the polyene antibiotic. Now, what is polyene antibiotic in the fungal, right? A very common example of polyene antibiotic that we know is amphotericin B. Now, how is it going to work? Again, a very common side effect that this polyene antibiotic, they will be acting by creating pore in the fungal cell membrane. And rest of the scenario will be same. Whenever there is a pore is created in the fungal cell membrane, right, there is going to be a leakage of the intracellular content. Leakage of the intracellular content outside and again, they will be producing the cytal effect. So, uh, we have only one topically available agent that is known as your natamycin. We can have some, we can use other uh, drugs as well, sir. I think in addition to topical, do we also give systemic uh, drugs in uh, treatment uh, of this? Not scenario? really, a lot of, so I use it because uh, cornea, cornea mm -hmm. being avascular, right. there is not much use of giving systemic drugs. Okay? Right. Mostly we right. give topical only. However, there are some conditions, for instance, corneal ulcer perforates right. you know, or endophthalmitis. Then we would like to, or scleral extension. These are the three important indications for systemic uh, drugs in mm -hmm. corneal ulcers. Mm -hmm. Three, one, endophthalmitis. Second, corneal perforation. And third, scleral extension because cornea per se is avascular and systemic drugs are not really recommended. It's oh. not useful enough. All right, all right. Thank you very much, sir, for that enlightenment. And uh, given that, I think uh, we can go ahead with the next question, which is uh, talking about uh, an asthmatic patient. Now, whenever in ophthalmology they ask about as asthmatic patient, students thought usually goes towards okay beta blocker or something like that. Presented with the glaucomatous uveitis with the intraocular pressure of 32, and ophthalmologist diagnose him as a case of open angle glaucoma and prescribe a drug that is acting by 
decreasing the aqueous production and I think it is also asking as well as increasing the uveo scleral outflow. What is the drug? Okay, uh, friends, look at the question here. Six year old mm -hmm. asthmatic patient present with glaucomatis. So, we already have a diagnosis of glaucomatis field Glaucoma, effects right. and interval of 32, which you know is very high. The normal cutoff is 21. Right. So, we got two out of there. Please remember, glaucoma has three things raised intraocular pressure, visual field effects, and optic nerve damage. Mm -hmm. And we need any two out of three. So, it's clear cut question of diagnosis. We've got two out of three here. Right. Now, the question is they've asked him that remember, in glaucoma, there is no management except we have to lower the intraocular pressure. You see, mm -hmm. Because the optic nerve damage is there, you cannot reverse it. The visual field effects are there, you cannot reverse it. The only thing you can do is lower intraocular pressure. And the question is very clear, we need to lower IOP, but the question is, we need a drug which does both, mm. not only lowers pressure by decreasing aqueous production, mm. but also increasing aqueous outflow. So here, the trick is and entirely in Dr. Siraj's hands, right. what is the answer, sir? And sir, as answer. I was expecting from all the students and we have Dr. Kishore and we have Dr. Knight, Dark Knight and other students also, they are marking Timolol. Now, whenever they hear about glaucoma and asthma, they go for Timolol, Bitaxolol. But here the question is little different. It is asking that is having dual mechanism of action. It is not going to be Timolol. The correct answer for this question is actually Brimonidine. That is the correct answer. Now, always and always remember two important questions, drug of choice for open angle glaucoma when they say I believe we call them as a PGF2 alpha analog that is going to be a latanoprost but if the question changes to drug of choice for open angle glaucoma if the word is India coming I think sir we write the answer as Timolol uh, actually <coughs> sir if we usually do not ask about India because in, in uh, this thing because right. that after all India is not separate from the rest of the world. Okay, okay. And you know, uh, Timolol is was used about twenty years back. Okay. This is so because of the I think cost yes, issue. The cost yes. factor mm -hmm. is there, you mm -hmm. know. So absolutely right. Drug of choice of open and glaucoma are the cost of an analogs. Okay. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Please remember that out of these drugs, the bimantoprost is the one that is the most powerful of all anti-glaucoma drugs. Okay. Prostaglandins reduce the pressure by almost thirty to thirty-five percent of right. the pressure. So these are very powerful. And bimantoprost will average loss of intraocular pressure is about 5.6 millimeters. You know, it's it's lowers by that much. Compared to timolol, which is only about 2.5 millimeters of mercury. However, the cost factor is a lot of there. You know, and in India, we always have to think about cost when you treat a patient. You know, in the OPD, when you are <coughs> sitting there, you want to prescribe bimantoprost. Now, bimantoprost is formulation is for the Indian drug itself is about almost about 500 to 700 rupees depending on company to company. Now you cannot ask a rickshaw puller to buy a drug every month 700 rupees okay and right. the, the and the, the pharmacological formulation that is imported is about 2000 rupees okay. So cost factor yes would be timolol here but remember this is asthmatic patient so right. timolol is anywhere ruled out you know, because right. it will immediately cause bumper constriction. So timolol is not the answer in any case the asthma here is a red herring. It's trying to divert your attention to the actual question, yes, exactly. which is a dual mechanism. That is why the asthma has been given here, right? Uh, just to divert. And usually, if uh, bitaxolol in the option, again, we would not be choosing bitaxolol here because they are asking about dual mechanism of action. So, when we want to treat a patient of the glaucoma, we'll try to increase the aqueous outflow. Now, as Sir was mentioning a while ago, that aqueous outflow can be incre increased by two important pathways. One will be by increasing the uveo scleral and other one will be by increasing the trabecular outflow. Now, normally in a patient with the opening of glaucoma, the trabecular meshwork is blocked. So, again, it is out of uh, question that we prefer this pathway. We will be preferring the other one, the one that is going to increase the uveo scleral outflow. So, the drug of choice usually we are going to prefer will be the drug that is increasing the uveo scleral outflow and that is going to be your PGF2 alpha analog that is again same that is latanoprost, bimatoprost, travoprost, you know, tafloprost, all of them. There is one more drug that is going to be your alpha 2 agonist. This alpha 2 agonist that we have guys, they are going to be your apraclonidine. Apraclonidine is one of the drug and we have one more that is bremonidine. So, they are uh, congener of clonidine only, bremonidine and apraclonidine, they are alpha 2 agonist. They are centrally acting sympatholytic and they also reduce your uh, aqueous formation plus 
they are going to increase the uveo scleral outflow now the second question comes that which of the following drug can increase the trabecular so for increasing the trabecular outflow we have to give a myotic agent and one of the very important myotic agent that we know will be pilocarpine but there is one more drug sir that is not commonly utilized i believe the name of the drug will be your epinephrine or its uh, uh, pro drug that is dipivephrine correct so are we using sir this dipivephrine in the clinical practice not really sir because we have far better drugs you see they are right. both very equally uh, mm -hmm. um, powerful mm -hmm. epinephrine but they have two many side effects right. so systemic as well as and even dipivephrine is a pro drug right. it still has ocular side effects right. so right. we are uh, in our practice in mm -hmm. most practices all around the world mm -hmm. we are not usually depending on epinephrine dipivephrine right. nowadays but for the examination point of view we will be telling you just remember for increasing the aqueous outflow that will be pilocarpine epinephrine increasing the trabecular outflow and we are having pgf2 alpha analog and alpha 2 agonist that is increasing the uveo scleral outflow so we have a pet by the name of pau just a way to remember right now one more thing that i would like to add on sir here in this question that there are certain drug that is also going to decrease the aqueous production so let us simplify this one as well this one will be as easy as your a b c d e that i say a b c d e this stand for your alpha 2 agonist again the same drug that is uh, apraclonin brimonidine we have beta blockers and under beta blocker i think we have a couple of them important one is timolol it is not preferred if there is a bronchial asthma which was asked twice already sir in the okay. past with the aims uh, so betaxolol which is a cardioselective one and it is going to be preferred if there is a history of uh, bronchial asthma c stand for your carbonic anhydrase inhibitor we have drugs like your dorzolamide which is highly preferred in a patient right pediatric patient right then we have dipivephrine which is a pro drug of again epinephrine so we try to read uh, the drugs that are commonly utilized in the management of the glaucoma will be as simple as your a b c d e and pet and pau so let's quick, quickly uh, repeat once again uh, what is a b c d e alpha 2 agonist apraclonidin brimonidine beta blocker like timolol betaxolol carbonic anhydrase inhibitor we have many others like dorzolamide is just an example i have given you dipivephrine and epinephrine out of this sir again we are uh, re, you know reminding the student that there are only two drugs that is having dual action correct one drug that is going to increase the uveo scleral outflow and also decreasing the aqueous production it is from the alpha 2 agonist that is apraclonidin brimoidine and then we have one more drug that is dipivephrine and epinephrine it is decreasing the production and also increasing the trabecular outflow this is the point to be noted here it will be increasing the trabecular outflow so glaucoma may always remember either they are going to ask this kind of question that which drug is working by which mechanism or their important side effect that will be summarizing in the upcoming question sir would you like to add something to this I would like to tell my friends that you know, <coughs> anti-glaucoma drugs are a very fertile source of questions, and usually we find in ophthalmology you get at least one or two questions Definitely. on anti-glaucoma. You know, it can be as simple as which is the drug of anti-glaucoma drug of choice in pregnancy. You know, which is contraindicated. For instance, prostaglandin analogs you would never give in pregnancy, right? Because they might will cause cervical dilatation and may lead to premature abortion also. You know? right. So certain drugs usually I must emphasize that you please go through anti-glaucoma drugs, the side effects, indications and contraindications. Right. Sir, I remember in 2022 last year there was a question that started again with the asthma patient. So can we give this PGF2 alpha analog in asthma patient? Is there Absolute, any contraindication? Yes, there is no, no contraindication right? at all. So that is what time. I wanted to highlight here in 2022 when it was asked and what is the best drug? Again uh, in asthmatic patient again you can utilize that. It is the most powerful anti-glaucoma drug that is PGF2 alpha analog. Right? So I think we can uh, go ahead and uh, uh, talk about the next question. But before that sir I have a question for you. Sir uh, you asked me the question that how do you make pharma easy? Uh, the same question I would like to know for our students sir, how do you make ophthalmology and we all know that uh, you, know, you are the dawn of ophthalmology but still our students for the new student can you tell us how do you make uh, well you see uh, ophthalmology is tough you know my friends are ophthalmology is tough but then life is also tough and um, yes. uh, medical life is not easy at all right what i would suggest is ophthalmology you know why is interesting is because I take situations from the clinic, you know, from the OPD that we see. And these are genuine patients coming to us. You know, these are patients who have a corneal ulcer, they have glaucoma, they have cataracts, you know. So I take these real life situations and build it around that. So it makes life easier and memorize it far faster, you know, because ophthalmology is a, is a, is a, is a science which wakes up when you can have at 40, you know, 
you know, and you know, most of you are 25, you know, though your attitude is beyond 50, most of you, I feel, you know, the way they study, the way they live, I sometimes feel, Dr. Saraj, that these are 50 plus students. <laughs> however, however, right, many sir. of you are 25, most of you are 25, and you think 50, 40, my God, so far away. It's not that, my friends, you know, you know time is just a blink away. You wake up, you blink, tomorrow you are 40. So after 40, all the ophthalmic problems begin, you know, press biopia, glaucoma, cataract, smacking degeneration. So these are the patients which flood out when you should come to an ophthalmic opening and see how many patients we have. So what I try to do to bring to the classroom is this flavor, you know, right. that of the student, uh, that the, the patient real life is crowding around. Yeah. Right. And maybe, maybe that's interesting and that is how it Sir, we have a query from Dr. Haru, isn't that carboprost is co contraindicated in asthma? Doctor, yes, it is contraindicated. Carboprost is a PG of two alpha analog, but that is not a drug for glaucoma. It's a drug that we are using for second trimester MTP. It also causes bronchoconstriction. But we are talking about other drugs like latanoprost and all, they are not contraindicated, contraindicated but definitely carboprost. And in fact, that was the 2023 exam question. That uh, 2023, uh, I mean, in March only there was an examination and in that it was asked already. So carboprost, yes, it is contraindicated because they are having additional bronchoconstricting property. They are having uterine contractility property as well. They are used for uh, no, second trimester MTP, right? So I hope that is uh, clear to all of you guys, right? So I think we can take the next question, yes, sir, given that. Okay, so uh, sir, there is uh, the next question over to you. This is a 55 year old patient mm -hmm. diagnosed with primary open eye glaucoma and was started with an anti glaucoma drug, which of the following drugs can cause the so, so on side. Now, here we look at the picture because primarily pictorial question, and you see there's one thing that is immediately there. Mm -hmm. And you see the first picture A where you have a lightly pivot iris, and the same iris after a certain drug has been given has turned dark brown. This dark brown, so the this is the side effects which we have to ask. So, which of these drugs they can cause this hyperpigmentation of the iris? Right. So, over to you, sir. Uh, sir, there is again uh, Dr. Haru. Definitely, they both are from same class, but the route of administration definitely matters. Okay. So, uh, go ahead and uh, answer this question that we have. Which drug will be causing this one? So, what is uh, what do we see here? Can you, sir, teach me how to see what what do we see in this image? See, here? in this case here, sir, you see one iris mm. is lighter, mm. the other same iris right. is darker pigmented. Right. Okay. Right. So, this right. is basically if you see this a drug which has caused hyperpigmentation, we call mm. this hyperchromia of the hyperchromia. iris. Hyperchromia. Right. Of the iris. So, the question asks is which of these drugs can cause it? And can, this can be very this, you know, uncomfortable for a patient who has light colored irises. Okay. It means most of us, we have dark brown irises, so right. we are not in danger. Right. But people, but there are people, particularly mm -hmm. from Kashmir mm -hmm. and other people also, mm -hmm. in India of course, mm -hmm. uh, who have these lighter colored irises. And for them, this is a very major cosmetic defect. So, we have to right. be careful when we prescribe this drug to lighter colored irises. So, the correct answer for this question is rightly mentioned by a couple of students that is going to be one of the PG of 2 alpha analog that is bimatoprost. And again, to remember these side effect of PG of 2 alpha analog, PG of 2 alpha analog important side effect. We used to uh, say that remember them by the very, very simple mnemonic of PG of 2 only. PG of 2 alpha ka side effect will be PG of 2 alpha. And this is going to stand for your uh, pigmentation of iris. This pigmentation of iris only, I think, sir, was uh, mentioning that there will be hyperpigmentation, okay. right? Hyperpigmentation. Then they also will be causing growth of eyelashes. I think we call the measure trichomegaly or hypertrichosis. Yes. Trichomegaly or hypertrichosis. Then they can also lead to fat atrophy of the orbit. Because of the fat atrophy of the orbit, there is going to be anophthalmus. So, one of the presentation can be anophthalmus after the intake of the drug, not exophthalmus. That you should take note. Then they can also lead to foreign body, atro uh, foreign body sensation. Not only that, they also can be associated with acute anterior uveitis. This is the most powerful anti-glaucoma drug, but definitely these are associated with some of the important side effects. And the side effect remembering is very, very easy. So, PGF2 alpha analog, side effects are PGF2 alpha, right? So, so these are the very good mnemonic, Dr. Sir, you have yes. memorized, make them some. I would like yes. to add a couple more, Yes, sir. which are clinically relevant. Yes, sir. Know? One, of course, is pigmentation as a hyper... Pigmentation. Remember, please, that uh, it, as I said, it does not affect us. We have already dark brown irises. But for people with light color, you know, gray irises, green irises, blue irises, and the most, the one iris which unfortunately has the most common side effect of pigment is the most beautiful iris of all, the hazel irises. The hazel irises get maximally pigmented. So be careful never to prescribe 
the postal analogs to lighter colored irises. That is one. Okay. Second, as you mentioned, is the uveitis. You know, so if any condition that has uveitic glaucoma, uveitis leading to secondary glaucoma, postal ganglia are contraindicated. Right. Okay. Third condition, they also have a lot of cystoid macroedema, CME. So any particular time when you have a drug, uh, uh, want to give anti-glaucoma drugs, you have to watch out for CME. So you will find that a question often asked is which anti-glaucoma drug is contraindicated in patients of after cataract surgery. See, after cataract surgery, you sometimes get secondary glaucoma. Okay, so in that case, you should not prescribe this because cataract surgery already has cystoid macular. Yes. and this will add to the CME. So the patients which will drop immediately. You can remember the anti-glaucoma drug that is contraindicated after cataract surgery is again prostaglandins analogs. Right. And one more <coughs> clinically, there are three more for is it often reactivates herpes simplex keratitis. Mm -hmm. So if a patient is past history of HSV, then we would not like to prescribe prostaglandin analogs. Sir, we have a question from one of our students. Which drug causes cystoid macular edema? And this is exactly what we are talking about. CME, yes. this is my friends, these are the, this is the drug which is most famous for causing cystoid macular edema. So, right. that is why we would not like to give it in patients of this. So, please remember, postal and analogs do cause a lot of CME. Right. So, that is the question to the answer. And so, please remember that this is actually, uh, uh, there have been cases reported in Western literature where the patient has sued the doctor. You know, they had this hazel irises and after prostaglandins, they developed a pigmentation, hyperchromia. Right. And this is irreversible, remember, this is irreversible, will not go back. Mm. So, this patient actually sued the doctor in okay. court. Okay. So, we have to be very careful about this. Okay. All right. Uh, All right. So, uh, looking into your you know, uh, complete command of pharmacology, doctor, yes, sir, I sir. want to ask you this. How sir. many of my students ask and do you, sir, how do you rate pharmacology as a career option? What do you would have to tell your students about that, sir? Uh, sir, as a career option, I would say, of course, it's a very uh, great choice only for those students, those who have no, uh, you know, uh, will or wish to treat patient. If you are having any desire to work as a clinician, if you want to hold a stethoscope on your shoulder, this is not a branch. But again, at the same time, if you want to make a very good career out of it, if you want to make very good money, if you want to settle outside of India, this is a very good career choice. This is the very bluntly and in one line, I used to say this one. Because if any student who is having a desire or who took MBBS that one day I will become a doctor and I will uh, use the stethoscope and I will uh, treat this patient and he, if he is coming to uh, pharmacology, most of the time I have seen they end up getting frustrated and they tend to leave this one. So, I would never advise this one. In fact, there is one video sir, on YouTube that I have taken here uh, on the YouTube itself where I have discussed uh, who are the students who should take pharma, right? Uh, Often time we see that there are students, those who are getting very good rank. They, is, you know, they are preferring pharma because again for the love, we were from one of those areas, those, you know, we were, you know, we were uh, trying to take clinical, but again for the love of the teaching, we tend, you know, we end up taking. I know one of my junior, uh, she got a very good rank, her rank is around 4000, all India rank, but still she chose pharma because uh, she wanted to work in uh, pharma industry. She was fascinated about Absolutely. pharma industry. So if you have that kind of desire, definitely you can go. Second reason, if you are not getting anything. And you want to settle down, <laughs> let's say your marriage is stuck because of this uh, no, branch, go ahead and take the branch, marry, settle down. So, that is one thing that I will say. Very, very practical consideration, Dr. Sir. Yes, sir. absolutely right. You know, I, I agree with 100%. Thank you. Because very much, these sir. are people, you know, uh, some of you, you know, when we are uh, in MBBS and we dream of, you know, these glamorous, you know, white coated figures mm. with right, stethoscope around your figure, and then you, you know, you, oh my God, you were sitting in a lab, you know, teaching students. I agree with you 100%. So, if you have that kind of dream, maybe, maybe pharmacology is not right. for you. But yes. otherwise, pharmacology, as we all know, gives you very good money yes. because in pharma industry, a lot of teaching scope. So, Sir, I know a lot money. of pharmacologists in India, they are practicing, they are a very good clinical practitioner. On the daily basis, they are getting at least minimal. I know my friends, I used to talk to them, they are getting 80 to 100 OPD on the daily basis. Okay. Imagine on the daily basis, not even a general practitioner sometimes, somewhere exactly. they are not getting. Exactly. So, it opens a lot of doors. You can practice even after doing MD Pharma, you can go into teaching, you can go into medical college, you can be, you know, professor, uh, you can uh, you know, excel in that field. Plus, you it also opens the door for pharmaceutical industries. Absolutely. So, it is definitely going to open three, four more doors for any one of you who would like to take Pharma. Thank you, sir. That I think, very clear. Thank you very much, sir. We can take the next question yes. here. Yes. Uh, sir, there is a patient who is coming with a unilateral fixed dilated pupil. So, whenever we hear the term unilateral fixed dilated pupil, mid dilated fixed pupil, mm -hmm. I think we think about angle pressure glaucoma. Correct, correct. Yeah. But here it is, uh, question is something different. It is not constricting to 1% pilocarpine. Okay. 
what is the most likely diagnosis sir over to you what now, do you think now this is yes. a very interesting question and yes. an aims question asked about 3 4 years back i think okay and this is actually a scenario which we get sometimes it's mm -hmm. a real clinical scenario so there is this patient who's got a unilateral fixed dilated pupil mm -hmm. and which is not comes to 1% percent pupil what is the most likely now first thing here please remember mm -hmm. that we have to see what are the choices given Third remember the, all the choices mm -hmm. they have the same presentation that they will have a dilated pupil right. okay right. third no policy will do that Blown pupil and uncle herniation will do mm -hmm. that. Pharma calls block it and ADS pupil. All of them pupil that. Now, how do I do this? So, what we do here, we have this simple uh, in clinical practice. We go stepwise. First, we put you know when we get a patient like that. So, we first put pilocarpine drops, 0.1 to 5 percent. This is only 0.1 to 5 percent pilocarpine put and see the result. Now, if the pupil dilates, if there is a bigger part, if it constricts, if the dilated pupil constricts, it means it is ADS pupil. So, 0.1 to 5. is the dilute solution the first step we do that and if the pupil constricts the answer becomes ads and why is that ads because the ads pupil basically is because of parasympathetic damage to the eye and what happens is in ads pupil you have a viral infection of the eye and is this damages the third nerve okay now the third nerve carries the parasympathetic fibers which are responsible for constricting the pupil so since the third nerve is damaged and the parasympathetic fibers are damaged so it cannot constrict the pupil So when we put 0.1 to 5 percent, it immediately comes. Why is that? The normal people will not constrict. Why? Because 0.1 to 5 percent is simply too dilute. It will not be able to constrict normal people. But because because the it's a viral denervation. Remember physiology. Please remember we call this denervation super sensitivity. So what happens when we put 0.1 to 5 percent? Even if it's very dilute, it releases a little bit of acetylcholine. This acetylcholine is enough. because the pupil is super sensitive to it is right. super sensitive so even that 0.1 to 5% will be able to stimulate the receptors and cause pupil constriction so which you can see in this lovely picture that we have put dr siraj yes, where you see this is the pupil you know this is the ads pupil dilated pupil right, and what we see is that the normal pupil the normal pupil is not constricting if you see there okay but this is the normal pupil it is not constricting with 0.1 to 5 okay right. but this is constricting this because of denervation super sensitivity right. so this is the first step that we do in this test so mm -hmm. the question says that it does not constrict with not only 0.1 to 5% mm -hmm. but even 1% right and that we can go back to the question please so the question says it's 1% so there is 10 times as much right so that means it is not ads and then it also rules out third nerve palsy and blown pupil and why the answer is simple because again in third nerve and blown pupil the pupil will constrict with 1% pilocarpine but pharmacology will block it will not constrict please sir uh, actually in third nerve palsy what they are telling that if the nerve and there is a nerve ending injury or let's say there is a nerve injury if there is a nerve injury sir i think acetylcholine release automatically will be gone yes and therefore we are going to use pilocarpine uh, what is this pilocarpine it is a parasympathomimetic drug correct it is a selective m3 agonist right this selective m3 agonist it will be directly working on the receptors we are not going to wait for the nerve to release there will be a directly acting drug that is directly going to work and if the parasympathomimetic drug like pilocarpine is given definitely it can cause meiosis the type of meiosis that we read will be active meiosis i believe yes and right. this is another very important type of question that is very frequently uh, right asked especially in aims active meiosis passive meiosis active meiosis passive meiosis i think we can take up in our upcoming session yes. sir Excellent. right so that is beyond the scope of for this lecture today but here if there is a nerve injury that will be third nerve palsy or blown pupil in uncle herniation i think in uncle herniation also sir the same the entrapment of the yes, nerves and correct. again there will be no acetylcholine release correct. so when we give pilocarpine will there be any effect yes but in a patient with the pharmacological blockade what is pharmacological blockade you see the receptor already is blocked this receptor itself is already blocked if the receptor already is blocked and no matter how much drug you are going to give from the pilocarpine they will not be effective in fact this is a very good example of pharmacological antagonist if you guys remember in pharmacology we used to read about a term known as your pharmacological antagonist now what is pharmacological antagonist this will be two agents competing for same site competing for same site and producing opposite action producing opposite action 
this will be pharmacological antagonist. So, here if let us say there is one scenario of pharmacological blockade that can be caused by sir M3 blockade M3 antagonist drugs like your tropicamide, homatropine, we have many drugs. Exactly. We are also having atropine right. These are the different drugs that we have these are the M3 antagonists. So, if the receptors are already blocked and after this if you are going to give let us say a pilocarpine where will it work? It will not be able to work. So, this can be one of the pharmacological antagonist for your pilocarpine. Likewise, we can also have one more example here with respect to pharmacology I will just integrate here that we have let us say uh, our propranolol that is a beta blocker I believe all of you guys are already aware about this one beta blocker it will be a pharmacological antagonist for your adrenaline because adrenaline will be acting on the heart they can cause tachycardia propanolol will be working on the same receptor on the beta receptor they can cause bradycardia right. So, again pharmacological antagonist or here the term that we are using here is pharmacological mm -hmm. blockade. So, if the receptor is already blocked no matter uh, this how much pilocarpine you give even 1 percent or higher than that they will not be effective right because they are competing for the same site. Absolutely. So, this yes. is basically the algorithm we use. Yes. Patient comes to us like this. Mm. So, we first put 0.1 to 5 percent. Mm. If it constricts, mm. it is ADS pupil. Right. If it does not constrict, then right. we go to next step which is 1 percent pilot right. right. And if it constricts, then it is third nerve palsy for whatever right. reason. It could be injury, it could be uh, farm, this thing, blown pupil or third nerve palsy or any kind of. And if it still not constricts, mm -hmm. then we are left with the pharmacology. Right. So, it must have put atropine or something which is blocked. So, I think we have easily ruled out this important question and we can take this uh, one question sir uh, over to you. Now, this is a more detailed question and yes. again let us pay attention. This is a yes. 32 year old female mm -hmm. patient present with sudden onset bilateral blurring of vision associated with severe pain and headache and halos around lights. Now, that gives us a clue. Halos around lights is a very specific clue. Mm. An ocular examination revealed a vision of 4 by 60. Okay, that is very poor vision, you know, hardly reading the first line and improving to 6, 9 with a minus 5. So, that is pretty high myopia with both eyes and intraocular pressure was 38 millimeters of pressure, very high again in one eye and left eye 42 and her, her medical history revealed medication for migraine and hypothyroidism. Okay, so, mm. all very Two questions, a 32 female is can have migraine and hypothyroidism which is pretty common in females. Which medical is responsible for this condition? Now, here, first of all, we have to diagnose the condition. Look at that. The question is blurring of vision, colored halos, loss of vision, very poor vision, both eyes, myopic and intraocular pressure high. So, this is a question as you can make out because of pain and loss of vision with intraocular pressure is acute angle closure glaucoma. Right. So, the question is which one of these drugs has well known to cause acute angle closure? Sir, I would just like to add before we uh, seek the answer from the student, this yeah. is the exact uh, uh, kind of question that we can expect from our uh, next examiner, right? Very the integration that we have, let us say there is a migraine history, then there is a pharma here, then there is a ophthal here, right? So, two, three subject, two, three topic integration are being uh, seen here. Sir, over to you, what do you think is the correct answer uh, for from our student? Can we ask? Yes, so we are getting answers, sir, about B. Students are replying B as an answer. And absolutely correct it is my friends the answer is indeed B. It is yes. topiramate which is often given in migraine patients nowadays and topiramate please remember is well known to cause these sudden acute angle. It is a very well known fact and you must remember this in your MCQ examinations because what it does the mechanism exactly is that topiramate it causes ciliary body rotation. You know, it causes ciliary body edema and it causes it rotates forward as goes forward and blocks the angle. So, it is a kind of acute angle closure glaucoma cause it and the, the fact remains the clue is that it is usually bilateral ok. It may occur unilateral. So, bilateral acute angle closure glaucoma is always pharmacological it cannot be normal ok. And second the higher myopia it also causes myopia and so that is why the answer is for minus 5 is improving with minus 5. So, these are the drugs which may cause acute angle closure glaucoma and topiramate is well known for that. Sir, uh, by looking at the drug topiramate, I always remember there is a simple story that I used to discuss in class that this is a very holistic drug. Nowadays, Ramadan is going on and this topiramate being a holistic drug and why do I call holistic drug? Because it wears topi mm -hmm. and when you wear topi, you feel like doing some holistic work and it is having all the good works okay. in the society. It is of course, it is a anti-epileptic drug. So, it is utilized in generalized tonic clonic seizure, partial seizure can also be utilized in Lennox, Gastaut syndrome. So, one holistic approach is anti-epileptic drug plus it give relief from migraine as well. 
होलिस्टिक है ना वन वन मोर वर्क ना होलिस्टिक टोपी पहन के देन अगेन इट इज एन एंटी ओबेसिटी ड्रग एंड एंटी एपिलेप्टिक ड्रग अप्रूव फॉर एंटी ओबेसिटी नदर देन योर टोपीरामेड plus again uh, very good work that it is going to do it is going to decrease the alcohol craving as well it wears topi and does a very good work so wears topi plus it is also utilized for the bipolar disorder so again five important uh, thing that you should remember that topiramid wears topi does all the good work anti epileptic drug bipolar disorder migraine anti obesity and also decrease the alcohol craving so i think that could also be one of the clue to uh, pick this uh, answer here and uh, with this uh, question sir i think uh, there is uh, one information that we should summarize here we have made a list of drug that is causing some of the important ocular side effect and i believe this is one a table from where we can definitely definitely expect one question Absolutely. right now uh, we have around 15 16 and you always get one question from here so let us quickly summarize and simplify the important ocular side effect like digoxin it will be associated with ocular side effect called xanthopsia that is going to be a yellow vision Sildenafil will be causing again the favorite blue pill. I think Sildenafil is also known as blue pill, sir. Yes, yes. yes. Sildenafil was colored blue and was first made huh. by Pfizer, so they made it blue. So blue vision, you can remember easily. Blue it's vision, blue, the blue pill causing blue pill. Right. Blue vision, Sildenafil. Right. And the only antipsychotic drug that is causing retinal pigmentation, this is going to be your thioridazine. It causes brownish retinal pigmentation, and sometimes in the textbook they use the term browning of visits. What is browning of visits? Every time the drug reaches there, they will be leave they leaving some of their pigment uh, in the retina, and they will be causing browning retinal pigmentation. This is going to cause corneal opacity. Often time it can also be associated with I guess vortex keratopathy, sir. If I am not and cataracts, yes, cataracts also chlorpromazine. Chlorpromazine yeah, can be associated with the. well known to cause cataracts yes it's one of the uh, typical antipsychotic a d2 blocker i think both of them are d2 blocker yes and then we have quetiapine which is actually a uh, atypical antipsychotics this is going to be your 5st2a blocker and this is associated with cataract mainly and we used to uh, no uh, narrate one story as well about a queen who was actually blind and she was running after some older zillionaires that's a long story that we don't want to go into that but queen was going after the older people because she was blind and right? andhi rani we used to say so again quetiapine is causing cataract that is another side effect that we have here vigabatrin that we have it is going to cause uh, you know peripheral retinal atrophy because of this peripheral retinal atrophy uh, they will be causing your uh, tunnel vision this is a term that we use i believe tunnel vision tubular vision evabradin it's a bradycardia inducing drug it's a funny current blocker actually vigabatrin is a gaba transaminase inhibitor it's an anti epileptic drug this evabradin it is going to cause a side effect that is phosphines sir can we tell our students what is phosphines actually the phosphines as a sensation of light when there yes. is no light reaching the eye you know you often get you know these whitish dots when you get hit in the eye mm -hmm. suppose you get hit in the eye you get these flashes of light So there's actually no light coming, but that sensation of the retina and the optic nerve being stimulated—that is called phosphines. I think we have already covered topiramate causing angle closure glaucoma. Chloroquine is one such drug that is going to cause your bullseye maculopathy. This bullseye maculopathy, often time it is said, it is a irreversible in nature. Bullseye maculopathy. Tamoxifen. Tamoxifen can also cause cataract. It is one of the selective estrogen receptor modulators. Ethambutol, it is going to cause optic neuritis. Sir, optic neuritis, often time it is also associated with some colored vision defect. Oh yes, yes. Ethambutol is well known to cause optic neuritis, retinal neuritis, a very difficult form to treat actually. So yes, we have to watch out for this particularly. They can cause red, green, red yes. green color blindness, yes. I believe. Yeah. We have amiodarone here. We have amiodron. This amiodron, it is one of the anti-arrhythmic drug, class three anti-arrhythmic drug. And what kind of side effect it can cause? It can lead to your corneal micro deposits, micro deposits at the cornea. Sildenafil, it can lead to uveitis. Pilocarpine associated with your brow ache because of a ciliary muscle spasm, and it can also lead to retinal detachment. Latanoprost, I think I have already discussed with all of you guys, like PGF2 alpha analog, pigmentation of uh, iris or heterochromy, you uh, know, hyperchromia iris, pigmentation of iris, and all the other thing we have already uh, discussed with all of you guys. Steroids. Now, steroids, sir, what kind of uh, problem it can cause? 
See, steroids we the most common thing that we have in ophthalmology is yes. we have systemic or which is yes. topical. So with systemic, mostly cataracts are caused. Okay. If it's topical, it's mostly glaucoma. However, they can cause both. Systemic can cause both cataracts and glaucoma, but much more in favor of cataracts. Topical steroids mostly cause glaucoma. So we can say steroids are associated with both kind of side yes, effects. Yes, definitely. Glaucoma, cataract, but glaucoma is mostly seen with the topical usage. Yes. And cataract is mostly seen with due systemic to the systemic. Issues. And we used to remember them by the mnemonic GTCS. Glaucoma due to topical usage, cataract due to the systemic usage. But again, as Sir was telling, this uh, glaucoma can be due to topical systemic both, but more commonly due to topical, yes, if I am yes, not wrong. Yes, yes, sir. So, I think, sir, we have uh, summarized here important 15 to 16 drugs and we always get to see one or two questions definitely from these yes. areas ocular. You can say as a pharma or ophthal question, that hardly matters, but when you sit in the examination and you are going to get the question, uh, we can always have one question. I think, my friends, it's a very important table and yes. you should take this down as a screenshot or something. Yes. Because it summarizes the most important side effects of systemic drugs causing ocular right. problems. Right. I think, sir, the time is not permitting, but definitely we can take one more question yes, for our students. That. Sir, over to you. So, <coughs> we are really sorry to extend this session, but mm -hmm. uh, one last question before we go. And is a patient present with intraocular pressure of 40 millimeters of mercury after being on topical steroids for 5 months? Exactly what we are talking about. the most important side. On top of 5 months. Now, what is the mechanism of raised intraocular pressure that after prolonged topical steroids? We just mentioned that topical steroids cause glaucoma. That's right. But what is the actual mechanism? Why should steroids cause raised intraocular pressure? Over to you, Dr. Siraj. <coughs> Uh, sir, the correct answer for this one, the mechanism, there are multiple mechanisms that has been given. The most accepted one is that they are going to cause, you know, hydration you know, and that is possibly due to, you know, hydration of glycosaminoglycan blocking the trabecular meshwork and because of this one, they will be causing uh, a problem that is known as your uh, glaucoma and we call it as a, again a secondary or drug induced. Right. So, these are the uh, three important mechanisms that has been mentioned that why or how steroids are associated with this kind of problem like increased deposition of the substances in the extracellular matrix causing increased elastin, glycosaminoglycan and fibronectin production and physical or mechanical changes in the microstructure that is also going to cause you know uh, cross linking of the actin fiber that is also going to cause blockade and inhibition of the proteases and trabecular meshwork. So, this tra uh, proteases or trabecular meshwork endothelial cell phagocytosis they are actually going to keep the trabecular measure patent or open. But whenever there is inhibition of this protease enzyme that was keeping it patent, what will happen? There will be increased trabecular measure and that will be causing uh, blockade of this trabecular measure. Ultimately, all this mechanism of action, either due to uh, no, um, your edema of uh, glycosaminoglycan or excessive cross-linking of actin fibers or excessive uh, no, uh, inhibition of proteases or trabecular measure uh, endothelial cell phagocytosis, what will happen? There will be trabecular measure blockade and that can end up causing glaucoma, right? So, this will be one reason for increasing the intraocular pressure, right? So, this will be the correct answer. I think uh, if I am not wrong, sir, this is one of the PYQ as well from yes, the yes, AIMS, yes, right? Absolutely. You see, because you see, it's a very genuine problem for our country. You know, we have multiple mechanisms of uh, glaucoma caused with steroids and we give steroids very routinely. Right. right? And you all know that steroids is a very powerful, is a very good servant, but a very poor master like fire. You let it out of control, it's going to consume. So we have these, you know, children who come to us. These are often people of spring catar or vernal catar. These okay. are kids from four, five year onwards, you know. So they are very severe spring catar allergy, you know, rubbing their eyes. So right. we give them steroids for one week. And that's okay, cool. they will. Uh, we know that uh, these are steroids, and they will reduce allergy immediately. You know, right. They are very unhappy people. You give a 10 year old child a steroid for one week mm -hmm. and we ask him to stop in one week, but this is India. Right, they, they continue. They disappear. Uh -huh. We have come there to follow up to one week to taper the steroids, they disappear, they come after two years. Right. You know, right. two years he has been putting steroids because it's magical in reducing the symptoms. And two weeks later he comes to, I cannot tell you, Dr. Siraj, with posterior subcapsular cataracts and raised intraocular pressure. Such tragic uh, cases. So, in, in our country, please remember, we must never prescribe steroids without telling that you have to stop in one week or if they don't come to you, they have to tell them to stop it. Otherwise, they'll end up with things like this. Right. So, saying that, I hope you guys have enjoyed the session today. We have covered some of the important areas of glaucoma, primary glaucoma or primary opening glaucoma, secondary glaucoma that is drug induced or some disease induced. 
Not only that, we have also covered some of the important uh, circulatitis like fungal, viral, bacterial Acanthamoeba, also we have yes, covered yes. acanthamoeba. So these are the important integrated topic of pharmacology and we really, really expect and hope that we are going to get at least minimum two marks from this session that we can assure you on the basis of the topic that we have taken and on, on the basis of our past experiences, right. So uh, I am going to end this session uh, with our beloved sir, uh, which is also, who is also known as uh, the Don, right. So Don ko pakadna mushkili nahi, na mumkin hai. Lekin sir, agar aapko pakadna ho to? Pakadna ho to, you have to catch me on YouTube, you have to catch me in our next class in Alan. Alan next. And you have to catch us Alan. And ladies and gentlemen, please, I hope you have enjoyed this and you have learned something from this. Please write to us if there are other, other questions we can do, always willing to extend the sessions later and yes, talk yes. to you about this thing. Definitely. No? All the best and I hope, really hope that you have learned something and enjoyed the session. Enjoy the session. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. I had a great learning today. Thank, Thank you, sir. Same here.